Good morning, everybody. Happy Monday. Welcome to Instrumental Breakthroughs. I am your host, Daniel Schenk, and I'm also the program director of Mount Tam Psychedelic Integration. We offer integration coaching uh, worldwide. Um, and before we get started, I would like to thank uh, our co-producers, Deadhead Land. Uh, really appreciative uh, of Brian allowing us to use the platform and hosting us, and also live stream remote for offering the uh, technical technical support. Um, and I'm very happy to welcome my guest um, from the from the Higgs in Southern California, uh, John John Lavera. Welcome. Thanks so much for being here. Hey Dan, thank you for having me. How you doing? I'm doing pretty well. I'm doing pretty well. You know, lovely. Lovely morning. Can't complain. Absolutely. So, and you? I'm doing great. It's a fantastic day. Nice sunny day here in Fullerton, California. Just enjoying it. Had my coffee and I'm ready to go. Right on. You look comfy. I'm, I'm very comfy. <laughs> I'm in my happy place. Awesome. The place of power. It um, <laughs> kind of reminds me of the Carlos Castaneda books where... They would make um, where Don Juan would make Carlos um, like close his eyes and crawl around on his hands and knees until he found his happy place. <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> uh, so the theme of the show is, as you know, is psychedelic origin stories of your favorite rock and roll superheroes. And so today you are that rock and roll superhero. Fantastic. I would love to talk about that. And so we're really curious and, you know, a good place to start is maybe telling us some of the experiences that you had that sort of made you this miraculous wonder that we are beholding with eyes of great love. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. Awesome. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I, most, most of my psychedelic experiences happened in my teens and my early 20s. And when I was younger, I went through a few traumatic things that kind of messed me up mentally. And there wasn't a lot of things that made me happy uh, at the time besides music. So music was absolutely therapeutic for me. And I was using it as a way to just cope with some anxieties and some stress and some depression that I was dealing with. And then uh, when I was about 16, I was able to combine those experiences. I was already a musician at the time and I, I was already playing a lot and, you know, experiencing with weed. So one of the more mild psychedelics. But when I was about 16, I had the opportunity to go see Phil Lesh and Friends. And this was at Vegas in 2005 in uh, San Francisco. And... So I was like a young dude. I'd seen Fish and I'd been slowly integrating myself into like the jam band and like the improvisational rock music scene and listening to a lot of Dead at the time, but hadn't experienced a true, as close as I could get to like a true Dead experience. Right. Um, so when I went to see Phil, I bumped into a buddy who uh, dropped some liquid on my hand and I watched that show and it completely changed my life. Jimmy Herring was playing. Barry Sless was in that lineup. Awesome. Uh, Jeff Sype was in that lineup. Rob Barocco and um, Joan Osborne was singing. And so the, the gurus that were on stage in front of me performing were at the highest level. And I was in the perfect headspace to absorb it. And it just took that factor of healing of what music could do to the next level so combining the psychedelic aspect with the music just was the ultimate way of getting in touch with um, emotions and understanding how to deal with them and how to understand thoughts that are coming through and how to process them with ease and with not so much judgment and um, it basically just kind of set me off into a direction of being able to use this experience for, for the future for good. And I kind of use that experience and other experiences like that uh, integrated with the way I think about music and live performances, even if I'm not, you know, using the particular substance, I'm still using those past experiences to 
influence my uh, present playing. So. Were you? Were you? Do, that's that's awesome, and I love that lineup. Um, that's Phenomenal. a great crew. Yeah. Oh. Uh, you know, one of the things that I really like about Rob, Rob sticks out in my head because he always just looks so stoked. Like Rob is like a hab, like Rob looks like he's happy to be playing. Uh, and that just fills me with joy. It's like, oh, right, right. We're, we're right. We're having a good time. <laughs> in, case, in case you didn't know where you were, what was happening, we're having a good time. Um, but you were talking about like healing and judgment. Do you feel like digging into that a little bit more? Because I think like self-judgment is like something that so many of us kind of struggle with and, you know, get be, be beat ourselves up and it's just not necessary. A hundred percent. So for me, the way that I've experienced it was, I don't know, kind of going through the day to day when we're not as in touch with what's going on and we've kind of... Um, are not in that flow state that we get into when everything is functioning properly in our brain. Uh, we can kind of like take thoughts that are coming in. I know for, I, I should be speaking more for myself, but sometimes I'll take a thought in no matter what it is. If it's a thought about something that I have to do around the house or a thought about another person. And I kind of tend to put a label on that thought, like good, bad, yes, no, like kind of like, it's almost like a brain rating system of like uh, how good it is or like um, you're like judging the idea immediately. Mm -hmm. But what I've noticed is when I've been on psychedelics is those thoughts can pass through without judgment, but still be looked at and still be carefully thought about, but you're not putting a good or a bad on it. It just is, it is mm -hmm. what it is. So things that have labels in our society, a lot of times things that you, you, you would often be taught to judge just through society, all of those things just kind of dissolve and you're given a fresh perspective on life and those experiences and those thoughts. And it's just so healing and it could take you from being in this terrible depressed state for months on end and just one experience. And you can wake up the next morning, just feeling so much better about yourself and just understanding mm -hmm. yourself better and understanding your thoughts better. I think that's really well put. I mean, it can be really interesting how our mind turns on a dime when we're in those spaces. Um, and that, you know, I think there's that old Buddha saying that says uh, nirvana and samsara are the same, you know, and it's, it's the same show. And then at one moment, I'm kind of horrified at how kind of base or selfish I, I am. And then the next moment, I'm in heaven, you know, and, and in total harmony in total harmony and catching the groove and, you know, dan you know, it's almost the difference between dancing with people and like everybody's all in one or just catching elbows. hundred percent, a hundred percent. And so how does this express itself in your music? Well, I think there's just uh, obviously a state of mind that kind of shifts when you're in when you're using this to influence the music. And I think one mm -hmm. of those things like is in music, you can have a lot of judgment too. Like you can have a lot of not living in the moment, thinking about what's happening next, being kind of taken right. out of that flow state. Like you're talking about where you're kind of catching the elbows musically. And okay. that, that could be you just being inside your head a little too much, thinking too much about what people are doing out in the crowd, thinking too much about what your bandmates are doing. And um, when you're not in your zone and you're not in that perfect flow state of like where everyone's dancing fluidly together on stage, um, it can definitely make the jams, it can hinder the jams. And especially if we're talking about improvisational jam band kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, that's what my band does. And I know that that's what a lot of the bands that you in the, in the scene that you're into does as well. And if you're too much in your head and you're thinking too much and judging your thoughts too much, you're not going to be free flowing and you're not going to be able to just roll with the punches and, 
conform like water, like a Bruce Lee kind of vibe where you're just going with it. You know, you, you really can't control much when you take four guys or five guys and you just say, all right, go for it. You're not going to be able to stop someone from doing something or change their thoughts. But what you can do is react. You can mm-hmm. react to what they're doing in the moment. And that's kind of a similar uh, idea is just like reacting instead of having those preconceived notions of what could be and just taking it for what it is. And musically that can just, it can advance your playing really, if you, you're able to let go in that way. I think it's really interesting that you say, you know, you can't control the four guys because it would also be my guess that four guys who want to be in a jam band together are kind of not into control anyway. You know, there's sort of like yeah, there's probably a slight anti-authoritarian sort of vibe running through there. So what how do we finesse? Like, what is it like to relate to those guys? Because I'm assuming, you know, you're not strangers, obviously. So there's some sort of relating. And, and you want to talk about how that works? Yeah, I mean, I think it's similar to a marriage where you're around a person a lot. You know exactly what makes them tick and you know exactly what makes them happy and not everything is always perfect and not, your thoughts always don't just match and line up. But what you do is you talk about things and you work on things and you get to a point where you come to some sort of agreement. And mm-hmm. it's literally like that musically too, where people are just having this conversation and we're talking back and forth, the four of us, and it's just kind of taking us on this journey. And we all know what the goal is. The goal is to, to reach the peak of the mountain that gives us that ultimate bliss feeling of just happiness and joy. Or it could be different. It could be more of a dark jam where we're trying to go into a different space. So we usually have a goal of like what the, the end of the road looks like uh, the, the, or the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Mm-hmm. But the way to get there is just a conversation. So yeah, it's, it's a lot of just listening And not so much thinking about what you're doing, but thinking about what the other people are doing and try to play off that. And that'll give you like endless amounts of thoughts and ideas to work with. This might be another left turn, but the dark jam. I'm really interested in the dark jam because there are, because those have been where some of my best work, inner work gets done. You know, there's this idea of sort of the hero's quest and the journey to the underworld. And it's um, the vision, the visual that I'm getting. You've Have you seen Ghost? No. Right. You're a little, I, I, my meta, so I have a meditation teacher. He actually was, wrote the screenplay to Ghost. Wow. And so it's kind of really, I mean, it's sure it's Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore and it was a blockbuster, but it's kind of deep and it kind of follows the hero's quest. And he has to go as a ghost. He has to actually descend into the underworld to find healing and to like build the skills that he needs to complete his hero's journey. And so that's like, it's like that for me too. Like I constantly need to kind of go into the darkness to find not just judgment, but, you know, hatred and greed and, you know, all of the, you know, all of the various pains that, that have been going on. And music is a really good way to ride that. And so as you being on, you know, the other side of that, what's it like? Uh, I think it's awesome. And it kind of, it gives me an understanding for why people like music, certain styles of music that I might not be into myself, like hardcore death metal, where mm-hmm. the music is just like guttural and it's like super aggressive. And it's, it's a feelings that we definitely have as humans that I think in, in that case, it's like they're working out those demons in this way where the jam band scene, you would usually look at it as more of like a place to come and feel like very light and feathery and happy and like very like a lot of major sounding licks, but it's actually not always like that. In, in fact, a lot of bands do like to make it dark. And I think it's just literally, you're just feeling what the musicians are feeling as they're going through it. And when Mm-hmm. You know, the guys change from a major three to a flat three and go minor. 
you're actually probably just feeling their soul. You're feeling them, that musician's energy and like mm -hmm. things are not always perfect and not always happy. And you, you got to actually work out those demons. And I think it, it's, it's just as therapeutic to have the amazing bliss jam where everyone's like reaching for the sky and loving each other and hugging each other. It's mm -hmm. just as important to have that jam as it is to have the dark jam where everyone's just like, getting down and the lights are red and everything is minor and in like the deepest part possible on the bass and on the guitar. And um, there's just something to be said for both of those feelings and both of those emotions. Yeah. Harry hood is popping into my head. I think that <laughs> live, it lives in both worlds. Um, but yeah. it, it ends on that the most extreme high note possible, which I think a lot of bands are searching for that. Well, I think that's really, there's that. And then, you know, the, when the dead go into something like Sunshine Daydream, you know, they go in, or, you know, like an Uncle John's band or something. It's just like, sort of like, okay, you made it, you know, and, and the ability to take somebody on that journey and then not, you don't want to leave them there. You gotta, you gotta bring them, you gotta bring them home at the end. You know, you can't, you know, you can't just sort of like open people up on the surgical table and just sort of be like, oh, look at the time. Uh, so true. So true. And that's that's cool. It's much like a psychedelic experience where the first few hours might be a little rough and it might mm -hmm. be a little dark and the journey might be a little tough. But then when you reach that place where everything kind of settles in and it gets comfortable, uh, you reach the light and you're home. Yeah. Yeah. And, and music plays such such a huge role in that. And you know, I think Jerry once said, you know, we understand we're sort of taking people on a journey, but we try not to pull too many cheap tricks. Like we know the cheap tricks and how to like manipulate people and stuff like that. And, you know, the, the, I think the real power is in, in knowing that and not doing it. I think it was Jerry. Sounds like Jerry. Yeah. And so... Will you tell me another story? Like, I liked the one with Rob Baracco and Phil in it. Um, will you tell me another one that's sort of like, will you tell me a story of when you went into one of those dark caves during a dark jam and emerged victorious? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see here. Okay, so one time we did... Uh, one song set at the OC Music Fest kind of around here in Southern California. Mm -hmm. And we did basically, it was essentially all improvisation, but there was a, there was some song in there <laughs> for at right. the, a little bit at the beginning and we wrapped it up at the end. But in between that, it was essentially, you know, 55 minutes or so of improvisation. And Working our way through that, we had a lot of those moments of the darkness, and mm -hmm. it ended up uh, being just one of those experiences where it was very therapeutic. There's a lot of people there, and it was very intimate. The, the stage was, like, low enough to where people were right there, and uh, it was late at night. It was after all the other bands had played, so there was, like, this energy built up from the day of music at the festival. So it, it was just... Uh, it, it was so cool because we had no expectations of really what was going to happen in the jam. We just knew what the beginning was and we knew what the end was and we knew we were going to play for an hour. So when you're in that place, it's everything is up for grabs. Like you don't know what's going to happen next. So that was just incredible. And watching back, it was really cool because we actually had, are, are you familiar with Marcus Rizek? No, who's that? He's a guitarist. Um, yeah, I think he's based out of the, the East Coast, moved to California for a bit, might be living in like Colorado now. But we worked through like our whole jam and then we had him come and sit in with us and like had like a five piece thing happen. And it was just so cool. And then at the end of the night, it was just so cool to talk to the bandmates and like experience that and see what everyone felt because that's so much different than what we would normally do. Normally we would do jams, you know, like a long jam would normally be about 25 even 30 minutes is getting kind of crazy but for, to do that for an hour and to be on our heels and be trying to think of what's going to happen next it was just uh an unbelievable experience mm -hmm. 
And so what was one of some of the struggle? It's the struggle is to not say too much too fast, because if you go to that place too quick, it's like, what's next? Um, mm -hmm. We have to save that ultimate peak, that ultimate experience where you're just like letting it all out and letting it all flow. And mm -hmm. you can't necessarily do that in the first 10 minutes. You can't necessarily do that in the first 20 minutes. You almost have to save that for the last five or so minutes of the jam uh, take to take everybody home. So mm -hmm. to not be able to do that and not be able to go to that place where you're so used to just kind of going there in about five to 10, maybe 20 minutes to hold off and to pull the reins and to be able to just not do, to not play to the things mm -hmm. that you're not saying musically. That was the hard part. The challenge was to not speak so much musically. Right, because we were talking in, before we went live about my difficulty with John McLaughlin. Yeah. And the too many notes. And so is it kind of like that? So is it not playing too many notes or is it not playing? Is it something thematically? Is it sort of like time as a stripper doing it just for you? <laughs> <laughs> it's totally both. It's It's thematically and it's playing too many notes. So in the sense of themes, it's like you don't want to push to that next idea or that next movement too fast. So if you have, if you can be repetitive in this case, it probably will work. If you can do something that's more of like a loop, something that can last for minutes without getting boring, something that you don't have to change. So that's like the thematic stuff where instead of moving from one theme to another theme to another theme, minute to minute, maybe save that for for five to ten minutes and then take it to a new place and a new idea but when it comes to too many notes um i agree with that in the sense of like playing too many notes uh too too fast and just playing too many notes in general like we have seven notes in the scale maybe you pick out three of those notes for maybe two minutes and you just repeat those three notes over and over again. And then you can kind of sit back and let the ideas develop themselves. If you kind of let the jam develop itself, it grows more organically and it feels less forced. That's a sweet Im image. That's a very, very sweet visual of letting it grow organically as you sort of, yeah, I mean, I'm yeah. getting sort of the sense of a trance. A hundred percent. And, you know, I, I think it works, especially for the style of music that we're into when people are on the dance floor and they get in that groove, they kind of want that repeating loop. Sometimes right. they don't always need a million notes and like this ever changing, ever evolving jam. Sometimes they just want to lock in for like five minutes and mm -hmm. then go somewhere else. So I feel like sometimes, especially like in the early years of when you're trying to develop a, a jam band or like you're trying to develop your skills, you tend to overplay and you tend to think that you need to do so much to keep people interested when really like if you just find something cool and groove on it, people are going to love that. And then you can kind of mess them up later with something really technical and wild, you know? Right. Cause ultimately it's about feeling. A hundred percent. It's not always are... about showing off your chops and like showing off how much you practice. It's, it's way more about getting people to feel good. Mm -hmm. Cause you know, what is that thing? It's like people won't necessarily remember what you said or how smart you are, but they'll remember how you made them feel, you know, they're not going to remember so like, on. yeah. Yeah. That kind of thing. Um, there's another thing that you said. I mean, I really do like this idea of like how we get in the groove and that that is part of the healing. You know, you think about sort of like the shaman's drum, you know, and, and if you kind of listen to, you know, old recordings of shamans or if you, you get to hang out with, with them um, in traditional settings, the drumming is not necessarily complicated. You know, it is... Um, something that creates a vehicle for our consciousness to travel on. And, 100%. And I think that's, you know, the people that are showing up want something for their consciousness to travel on. I totally agree. It's, it's can be something very simple. 
you know, mm-hmm. very, very simple. And uh, even now that you bring that up, it makes me think a bit of like Indian music where it's kind of both. It's, it's mm. super complex in that it's like very notey. And I think they use, well, they do use a scale that has more notes in it than the Western scale does. So it's very complex, but at the same time, a lot of it is all in one key and it's all in one droning key that kind of keeps you in that flow state that like almost that ohm kind of feeling where uh, you're very meditative and you have this uh, feeling of being centered and very mm-hmm. balanced where it's not changing and going all over the place. It, it is uh, melodically, but as far as like the chord structure, or, like the keys, the key is just kind of staying in that same spot and just, you're just riding that vibe for as long as you can. So um, I think that mm-hmm. simplicity is important a lot of the time. I feel like a lot of those musicians, those Indian musicians, were also magicians. You know, it's like I, I feel like they understood what kind of spells they were casting, like the notes and what they were doing to the people's consciousness who was listening. Um, can I tell you an old Indian folk story that I might get wrong a little bit? Please do. I just <laughs> thought of it. Um, that there was a king who was, his wife was pregnant, the queen was pregnant with the prince. And the astrologer said something like, if he was, if he's not born before sunrise, then great misfortune will befall him and the kingdom and and so on and so forth. And he got one, one of the court musicians who was highly, highly skilled, and he had him play the nighttime raga, right? You know, like this song that is for night, you know? And the guy played the thing and held off the dawn so that the queen could give birth before sunrise. Like he was actually able to use his music to keep the sun from rising for like an hour or two. Wow which is is powerful right Absolutely. and is probably ultimately a metaphor for our our consciousness and maybe even now that i think about it a metaphor for how we travel in those dark jams like what is coming forth like what are we giving birth to if we spend enough time in the dark places of the soul assisted by a musician who's willing to take his time to let the song emerge organically. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's very, it's a very relatable story. I mean, it's, it's spot on. It's, uh, how so what's that? How so? Um, I just mean like, like how you're saying how, like it's, uh, if you spend enough time in something, what can come of it and what kind of like going back to healing, how you can use that to not only heal yourself, but be healing others. Mm -hmm. So um, for me, it was uh, Jimmy Herring and Phil healing me at an early age. So now I feel like that hopefully can be passed down to what I'm doing and what our band is doing. And we can give that back. Cause I'm, I know certainly the people that are coming to see our shows, the crowd is certainly helping me heal. So, um, I, yeah, I just feel like it, be, it becomes like this everlasting loop. Mm-hmm. Right. There's that one quote, I think, that, you know, our healing is bound up in each other. You know, if you're sort of helping me because you think I'm broken and you're here to fix me, I don't want it. But if you're healing me because our liberation is bound up in each other. Um, That almost kind of reminds me of the miracle ticket attitude. You know, it's like, like everybody has to work to make sure everybody gets their ticket before everybody goes in. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. You said another thing about trying to keep it from being boring which I think is important, especially because, you know, we're a group of people who can listen to the same song and to a bunch of musicians noodling for 50, 60 years. And so with that in mind, and and with, 
you know, this understanding that there's a certain tradition that we're very enamored with. How do we also keep things fresh and new? I think just varying. I think we're doing a good job of it in the scene in general. And I think I've kind of touched on this in my podcast a little bit, but uh, that's kind of the beauty of the whole like improv scene, the jam band scene is that you can find any style of music really that you want in this scene. It can be anything from Mm. super grateful dead inspired with that, like folky dead feel, or it can literally, you can find like a hip hop band that's in like the jam band scene or like an EDM band or a bluegrass band or like a more hard, heavy metal kind of rock band. I can think of all these different styles of music that are keeping this, like, uh, like you said, like long guitar solo, long jam style of music alive, but with so many different options and so many different flavors. I mean, I can listen to Umphrey's McGee, which is like they're rocking and heavy metal and then go listen to Sound Tribe Sector 9 that has more of like a cool like uh, mm-hmm. d- drum and bass, like g- cool like house kind of beat thing going on and then go listen to some String Cheese Incident. And so like uh, it's f- for me, it's like it, it's hard for it to get boring within the scene. What's what's what I'm trying to do is keep our music fun and keep our music relevant. And when you're jamming a lot and you're playing a lot of the same songs, uh, things can get boring. So I think that's Mm. like the beauty of this scene is like these bands are able to mix it up from night to night to night. You can go see a band three nights in a row and they're not even going to play the same song a lot of the times. So um, I think the, the scene is doing the best job of keeping things fresh and keeping things not boring. So when I'm, you know, 70 years old, I can still be listening to these up and coming bands and, and the legends like the dead and almond brothers and fish and uh, still be enjoying it. Right. Yeah. I sort of feel like it's almost when I hear you say that it makes me realize that it's our personal limitations that keep things boring. Because I do meet people who it sort of seems like, you know, that, that there is contempt prior to investigation. Oh, I don't listen to that. I don't, I don't like, like, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't like those guys or I'm not interested in that, or I just listen to this. Um, and there is a very interesting kind of arrogance that sometimes pops up that um, I guess isn't really helping anybody. Like, you know, it's probably, it's not helping the scene. It's not helping the music. It's not helping the band that you're like, oh, I only listen to widespread. You know, I've just pulled it out of the air. It's no disrespect. Sure. Um, but, you know, you're not, you're not, you're not helping Dave schools any with that attitude. <laughs> you know? Yeah. He has other projects too. <laughs> right. Being that like you could quite possibly be turning your nose up at something he's producing. Absolutely. And not even know it. Sure. Yeah, I think uh, you at least have to investigate all the options. And if, mm-hmm. you know, a friend says, hey, you got to check these guys out, you got to at least give it a shot. Right. And that same concept kind of comes into play musically a lot of the time, too, where uh, guys will bring up ideas in the practice studio. And it's like, if we don't at least try the idea, how do we know that we like it or not? So, like, a guy can say, like, oh, we should do like a little G run here and then do two hits at the end and then another guy if it might be thinking nah that's not even gonna sound good but if you don't at least give it a shot there's Mm -hmm. uh it's kind of it's not smart you know because you might be surprised you might be like oh that was actually an awesome idea it sounds great with the song let's keep it and that Mm -hmm. same kind of thing might happen with you if you're being uh, you know, given a band by your friend, like, Hey, check these guys out. And if you immediately just turn it off and push them away and don't give yourself that opportunity to listen to that band, you're closing yourself off to something that you quite possibly might enjoy a lot. Right. That could heal you. That, that could, could heal absolutely the heal you. Yeah. You know, okay. So here's something that I've been struggling with ever since I read the article yesterday. Um, I didn't read the article till it, since I heard the quote, um, Spotify. Can we talk about Spotify? Let's talk about Spotify. What's going on with Spotify? The, um, they don't pay the artists. Very little. The CEO is worth $4 billion. Wow. He said that musicians aren't making enough money because they're not producing enough. And if they produced on a regular, if they produced daily, then they would make more money. 
and so and it's my sense that art you can't hurry art and that art takes time and that i value artists and i want them to i want their art to cook as long as they feel like it needs to cook um so and and that guy and, and just you know there's this the photo of course they picked a photo where he has this super smug look on his face that almost sort of like incites violence you know you almost you know you want to shake the guy or slap him or something um which is not you know i'm not i'm not proud of saying that you know um but they, they give you that smug look and so it makes me want to cancel my spotify account Right. It's my first instinct as well. It's just, you know, you, they're right. I've heard about this before. There's other ways to support artists and things like that. On the other hand, m so much of what I listen to are the curated playlists they make for me. And so I had forgotten about Grey Boy All Stars. And yesterday they gave me Grey Boy All Stars. I was like, oh, right, that song. I love that song. You know, and then there was like Fine Corinthian Leather by Charlie Hunter. I'd never listened to that. I knew he was good. But it's like, oh, that album's sick. You know, it is like, so a lot of my exploration is kind of curated for me by algorithm. But at the same time, I'm not supporting the artist the way I would like to. So like this sort of relationship is working for me on some levels and not working for me or really the world or really the community I want to be a part of in others. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, so public service announcement to the people out there, if you want to support the band, go on their website and buy some merch, buy a t-shirt, buy a CD. Cause that's really what is going to support the artist directly and help pay the bills, especially in these times right now where musicians go from playing however many shows a year to provide an income for themselves and their family to pretty much nothing, you know? So um, now is a good time to do that. And yes, yeah, Spotify is definitely the new way of listening to music and it's the new way of keeping everything in one place. And it's extremely convenient. The AI features are very smart. They know exactly what you want to listen to. So yeah, there's a lot of positives and there's a lot of negatives when it comes to Spotify, but at the end of the day, uh, the Higgs music.com slash merch, go check it out. You know, it really. Oh, helps. wow. So I'm lucky you have a Ryan Kerrigan print. Yeah. Yeah. So I dig Ryan. I met him once, you know, he was nice and sweet and I bought some pins and he's got a really great style. I'm just, you know, and there are still 20 in stock. Yeah. So right. that's a, that's a good way to support. That is a good way. Now I'm, I'm dorking out on your website. Cool. Um, <laughs> Jamie Lee Mayer. This is another great looking poster. Yeah, only I mean, we've been stock. blessed to work with some phenomenal artists. Just, man, I miss those days of playing shows and uh, making posters. Got to get back to it. <laughs> right. Um, so how are you keeping busy with no shows? With no shows, we've, we did a live stream very recently, and it was fantastic. It was very well produced, um, like four or five moving camera angles with like all the cut-ins and overlays and very well edited. It was really live, like actually being presented as we were playing it. And um, we're going to start making that a monthly thing, actually. So uh, mm. every second Thursday of the month from now on, we're going to be doing a live stream. And it's really cool. It's from this place, Bridge Studios, which is just shout out to Bridge Studios. They're in Burbank, California. Phenomenal full recording studio with like real Neve boards and like the whole thing. And so we're going to really ones? I'm sorry. Like we real, real boards, like sound boards. Like, Got um, it. like what I said was Neve, which is a brand. Got it. Uh, for the gear nerds out there. But, um, and yeah, like I said, HD moving camera angles, multi angle all live streamed right on the fly. 
So really excited about that. We're doing those types of things to keep busy. Um, I myself to keep busy started a podcast. So I'm on episode four. We'll be coming out with episode five this next week. Um, so th- making a lot of like videos, made a couple of videos with my wife. Like for example, um, Peter from Goose was on cameo i believe and was asked to play a hig song so he was playing one of our songs on acoustic guitar so i ended up making a cover of a goo song with my wife kind of in response to that oh funny wait is cameo the thing where you pay 50 bucks and a famous person sings you happy birthday exactly right are you on that no, no, but Peter Onspock from Goose, I right. believe, is on that. And I think that someone may have asked him about the Higgs or asked him to do a song. But no, I'm not on there, but maybe in the future. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah, it seems like uh, I went on there once and I, I think it was a lot of the cast of The Office were on there. I think I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, so the things, um, what was the last... You said you produced a video recently. Yes, we did a live stream at Bridge Studios a few weekends ago, maybe like two weekends ago, and that would be live from their Facebook. So these are coming off their Facebook, but we're sharing them to ours as well. So you could go to our Facebook and find them. Um, And they're also streaming them live to Bridge Studios uh, YouTube. So they're also going to be archived there as well. Um, If you think about it, you know, ping me or something i'll share them of course always cool awesome Um, thank you yeah Hmm. yeah so looking forward to do more more of that type of thing more live streaming um private small gatherings things like that you know we did a show at the wayfarer which is our local spot here that we would normally pack about 250 people into the venue itself but what we did was they set up a little patio in the outdoor area and this was like right around the time that phil had opened back up terrapin crossroads it was actually like right around the same weekend and we did a similar thing outdoor show socially distanced i wore a mask the whole time and the next weekend they just called it quits kind of almost exactly same timing as Terrapin and how that went back up and right. that got canceled as well. Did you guys put the white boxes around people's tables? It wasn't quite that uh, set up, but what they did was they just had tables that were very socially distanced, uh, right. no, no tape to keep the humans in enclosed, but there, there was an idea of like, all right, this is your space over here. This is your space over here. And it worked out very well, but at the same time, I just don't think society is ready for that yet. And that's okay. I'm absolutely cool with just going with the flow right now. Right. Well, the thing about it, we went to one of those. I went to one of the things with um, Stu and Graham Lesh. Awesome. And first of all, well, it was expensive. Sure. You know, so because it was a price fixed dinner and it was small attendance and we sort of wanted to do it once we wanted to try it we were were, it's like we can't do this all the time let's give it a shot let's see what it's like and yeah there was there was tape around our tables and there was an extra table for the food to come in and out you know so you didn't get too close to the waiter okay but i believe they closed because one of the waiters tested positive that's what i heard which is um scary and a bummer um, yeah. And it's really, um, you know, interesting how it sort of kind of makes us appreciate sort of our local environment and maybe also our local musicians, right? Because you're saying like you're playing local. It's like we were looking at the, you know, the local guys and, um, you know, I was pushing the baby stroller through the park. And there was just like a guy on a bench, you know, this was probably like late March, early April. It's one of the first times we left the house. Um, and we're, you know, we're wearing, I don't even know if masks were really much of a thing then. maybe they were. Um, but it was, it was at that point, I think it was basically everybody just stay home. Sure. But, but we went to a park and we were taking a walk and we were very distant from people. And there was one guy on a park bench playing guitar. And we were just like, zoop, you know, and he just like 
plunked around a little bit and we chatted a little bit, but it was just kind of so nice to hear somebody play some chords out in the world. Yeah. And I'd be lying if I said that I didn't start to kind of take things for granted a little bit. And I never expected that something like this could happen and everything could just be taken away. And that's Mm -hmm. so naive to think like that because, you know, we're very aware of how, you know, our lives could end tomorrow, things like that. But you never think like a pandemic is going to hit in 2020 and uh, Mm -hmm. we're not going to be able to go see shows. We're not going to be able to perform shows. So, you know, it's very humbling experience and it really, really makes me appreciate the times spent on stage and in the crowd and just makes me appreciate how lucky I have been really and how lucky we all have been. Right. And almost it sort of makes it come brings me back to like playing too many notes and keeping it from getting boring and these sorts of things. Because it's almost like when you were talking about sometimes we feel like we have to put so many notes all in at once instead of just kind of letting it emerge is almost I used to be a massage therapist. I used to do a lot of like a lot more healing work and things like that. And one of my teachers would say, you're not a laborer, you're an artist. The idea is not to just do the most strokes possible in an hour and just use the most pressure possible. That's not what we're doing. It's like we're, we're practicing an ancient art here. And, and it was like, oh, okay, like I don't have to like grind myself into dust to provide healing. And so I sometimes worry about, you know, listening to this CEO of Spotify telling people produce, 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 you know, it's like, get on the road, get on the road, go more, further, more, further, more, you know, it's, it's almost like the same attitude. And it's like, how, how can, you know, the, 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 you as musicians and us as consumers of music just sort of kind of appreciate more space and a healthier way of doing things. Yeah, it's just really not feasible to be releasing music um, at that fast of a pace unless you own a recording studio with all the best gear and you're able to somehow during this pandemic just be nonstop practicing with your music, with your band and writing songs. And um, a lot of times that process isn't, it's not like a nine to five where you clock in and then Mm -hmm. ideas just start flowing out of you. Um, A lot of times it has to be, it has to just come to you a lot of times. And these ideas aren't forcible. So yeah, I think that guy might be a little bit out of touch. I don't know him, but I wonder how many bands he's been in and how long he went on the road for and how many thousands of miles he's traveled and how many Motel 6s he's slept in. And um, yeah, I'd be curious to find that out. Maybe he knows. Maybe he's a road dog, but it, it seems like he might be a little out of touch with what's going on. But right, it's just my opinion. Totally. And so, but when you are able to go back on the road, will you do it the same? Will you do it different? Are there lessons learned? Are there new ways of of thinking about approaching the world? That's a really great question. I mean, safety is the first thing that comes to mind for transitioning back into touring again, whenever that may happen. So yeah, just overall uh, hygiene and things like that, things that maybe weren't considered as much on the road before. And um, I'm sure the venues will be having to take those types mm-hmm. of precautions. But beyond that, I feel like the overall uh, the overall business model wouldn't really change much. It's just like book shows in different places in different states and play those Mm -hmm. shows and do that as much as we can and serve our community by bringing them music. And uh, so it's, it's not one of those things where I think musicians are having a harder time than most adjusting to this whole thing. Yeah. There's live streaming and there's that type of thing, but there's nothing like filling up a venue of people and having your merch table right there for everyone to walk up to as they're having a drink and just Mm -hmm. the overall flow of how the, the band works 
it just works so much better in a real true live setting. So, yeah. Yeah. I think everything would kind of stay the same as far as how we would do things on the road, Pretty just cl- more clean. <laughs> yeah. You just mentioning mics. that you ma- you're making me miss weaving through people. Yeah. To get, to get back to my friends, you know, you go to the bathroom and then you kind of weave through people and maybe have a drink in your hand and you're not allowed to spill it. There's something very Taoist about it. Oh, it's, it's such an experience, <laughs> man. The, everything, the, mm-hmm. the, the time leading up to the show where you're hanging out with your friends, you're deciding where you're going to go get for di- where you're going to go for dinner, or where you're going to mm-hmm. eat at home. And then, you know, you have a couple of drinks with your friends before the show and then the show happens and then post show hang. I mean, it's all this amazing experience that's encompassed in an evening. And uh, I've certainly, everybody is itching for that right now. And if people are able to do that through live streams and get some sort of connection, it's, it's great. It's great that we have that technology, but it's just not quite what we're used to. Is there a venue you're looking forward to playing again? You know, I'd absolutely just be stoked to play the Wayfarer again, which is where we did that outdoor right. venue. But if we were able to do it full on, like we used to, to pack everyone in there and have everyone feel safe and happy, mm-hmm. that would just be awesome. So I, even something as humble as that, as the local hometown show, I'm right. I'm so excited for. It's nice that they, we've, um, you know, all, all horrors aside, it's sort of nice that we've become a little bit more homebodies, you know, in some ways. Yeah. I've certainly appreciated the time spent with my wife and my dog and being able to mm-hmm. actually cook a nice home cooked meal. And uh, there's been a lot of positives to this. And I think uh, it's in a, in a lot of ways, it's a blessing in disguise. And if you're able to perceive it in that way, you can get a lot out of this right now. Um, how long have you been married? I've been married for uh, over two years, going on three years. Okay. How has that um, helped make you a better musician? I've been married two years. I'm also new. I'm, 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 yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, in every way, like, like it literally helps me be a better musician because she's actually a vocal teacher and a piano teacher. So Mm. she literally helps me sing better. And, but not only that, just like the overall support of having someone having this team where it's 50, 50 and you have each other's back. So when I'm able to go on the road, she's able to stay at home and run the business. We own a music school together that usually we have a lot of students at our studio here in Fullerton, but Mm -hmm. right now a lot of it is like over zoom lessons and things like that. So yeah, just like something like that where I'm able to go away for up to two months or so at a time and she's able to hunker down, keep the business going and, uh, you know, take care of the dog and um, just the overall emotional support of right. having someone there. Uh, it's 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 tough to be alone and it's even, I think it would be even tougher to be alone as a musician because there's a lot of moments where you need that pick up and you need like someone that's got your back right right um is the musical just for kids or is it for grown-ups too oh it's for all ages i have students that are all ages very young and um older yeah you didn't plug that yet yeah so lark music lessons were in fullerton california but also you could just dm me on instagram and we could set Mm. something up on zoom or um yeah do like some sort of video lesson and uh, I have a lot of that happening right now because the pandemic, it seems like a lot of people who have always wanted to play guitar and one has just been collecting dust in their closet for 20 years are now going, mm-hmm. hey, I got some time off work and uh, might as well learn how to play guitar right now. So if you're interested right. in that, hit me up on Instagram. Nice. Yeah, I've learned how um, a little bit more about how sequencers and synthesizers work. Awesome. And that's been really fun. Um, what are you working with over there? Oh, geez, man. I'm working with a with pocket operators. What is that? A pocket operator. Is it? I wonder if it's in. Pocket operators are just what they sound like. They are, you know, about a hundred bucks a piece. And they are these little tiny battery operated gadgets, these travel gadgets 
And this is a sequencer. This is a sampler and sequencer. Whoa. And so it's this big and it has a little bit of a, it's got a little microphone and it also has an in jack and it has an out jack and it has, it's a 16 step sequencer. Whoa, that's awesome. So do you record samples with that and then sample them? You can record. So it has two different kinds of the first eight are, are um, chromatic samples. You know, you, you, you know, you, you go boop, 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 right? And then the last 16, uh, the last eight are this, or is this are, is the drum machine. And so what that does is it, you give it one long sequence of drum sounds and it chops it up into 16 pieces. And so on line, on YouTube and stuff, there are people who have put together drum kits, these 16 sound drum kits and so you can load those in there and then you can just you know step sequence and it's been a lot of fun uh, i also got a chance to work I, I visited my brother recently and he has a bunch of real equipment <laughs> he, has a, he has a bunch of real stuff where you can you know modulate sounds and, and play with pitch and octaves and sawtooths and things of that nature you know a lot of words that i forget but sure. um but that is really interesting to me is sound design sound design is really interesting to me like getting weird sounds and cool sounds and then kind of just putting together you know these simple sequences i don't know how to really take you know if I, i'll get a loop i can build a loop i don't know what to do with it <laughs> I, I haven't gotten that part yet. That's but, cool, man. But um, yeah, and it was really cool because like one of he's got a five year old, and I was play. I was me. I was playing with the sounds. You know, I was playing with the the various modulations of the synthesizer, and then he came up and started playing it you know, on the other side, you know, it's like, I'm play I'm making the sound and he's playing it in real time. And so like, I got to jam with like my five-year-old nephew. Oh, that's awesome. For about five minutes before he got bored and wandered away. He does, he wandered in and he wandered away again. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, but um, what I'm saying is that if I wanted to learn guitar, I would go to Lark. Yeah. Lark music lessons. <laughs> is really Absolutely. what I'm getting at. That's that's exactly right. <laughs> Any last sort of cosmic psychedelic thoughts you want to leave people with? I just want to spread the thought of positivity and joy to everyone out there and to everyone that's in this wonderful music scene that we're in. I just want to I want to hope to see you soon and hope that things get rolling again soon. And if not, um, you know, I'm always available on Instagram. You can always hit me up there. Uh, but yeah, beyond that, just um, plug the, the Higgs, the Higgs merch, go check that out. Uh, go check out my podcast, John Lavero actualized podcast. That's on Spotify and Apple podcast, uh, YouTube. If you want to see the video version. Right. But man, this has been so fun and I really, really appreciate you inviting me on the show. Yeah, I, it has been fun. And thanks for going deep with me. Yeah. Um, I really, en I really enjoyed it. Um, I, and I have listened to an episode or two of episode or two of your podcast and I've seen the, you know, featurettes on social and I enjoy, I enjoyed both some of you sharing personally and, kind of sharing technical tips that are not useful to me necessarily as, as such, but we're definitely insightful into what it takes to be a good musician. Um, and I just love the work that you're doing out there. I, I super love the positivity um, that you're putting out into the world and, um, you know, the fortitude with which you are meeting the challenges. Um, so thank you so much. And, you know, I, I hope to, you know, I hope to see you around, uh, around the venue sometime. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, man. Thanks for the kind words. And for sure. uh, yeah, man, thanks again for having me. This has been super cool. For sure. This, I will, uh, I'll shoot your line when it gets, when it, when it 
goes into the ethers and stuff. Perfect. All right. Be well. Uh, Many blessings. Yeah, you too.